Vinny, can you see if uh, are we transmitting? Yeah. Yep. To the YouTube, shows. please. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, so let's start. Yes. Well, first of all, I would like to thank to Digital Future for this opportunity. For us, uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here with you and, and share our, uh, our researches and uh, this workshop. So um, I'm going to share the screen and start to present some, some issues about the workshop, okay? Let me know if you are watching the, the presentation, please. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. It's in the and right now, place, yeah. Now it's okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have here our team, me and Isabella Previti, Vitor Sardenberg and Vinicius Iuli. Um, so my name is Gil, Gil Franco is my name. You can call me Gil if you prefer. Um, so I said it's a pleasure to, to welcome here, to, to start here. And um, it's a pleasure to share our workshop with you. I'm a professor at the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul here in Brazil. And um, I coordinate a research group called Algoritmo, which is a, a um, a research group interested in digital culture and uh, digital design processes. So here you can see and access our social networks if you want to, to get more information. So I did my PhD at USP uh, which is a great university here in, here in Brazil, and I participate to the and, and I participate in the Nomads Research Group under the guidance of guidance of um, Professor Anne Pratsky. Um, I was also on a sandwich period on the TU Delft, uh, working with the Hyperbody Research Group, and uh, during this period I was able to participate in some experiments, some of them with the AA visiting school program. And uh, during this period uh, that I met uh, Victor Sardenberg, which is here with us, Victor was one of the teachers and he helped, to, helped us to develop a sequence of three dynamic and, and supple pavilions. Um, you can see here, these three pavilions. Uh, the first of them took place at Fiesp in Sao Paulo in, in 2012. The second pavilion wa was made in, at the OCA in the um, Iberapuera Park, also in Sao Paulo in 2012, I think. And um, the third one took place in, in Rio de Janeiro in a summer school shed also in 2012. Um, the three had the objective to, um, of being pavilions that could explore principles of interactivity. So we have this diagram that represents the general idea of the supple pavilions as they, they were called supple pavilions. It is a cybernetic loop which um, from light sensors feels input to an Arduino and a series of uh, activate, activated devices, um, the pavilion and its movements. So the idea is to um, keep a kind of an infinite loop, something like that. So I would like to introduce my crew uh, and I, I would like to, to ask Victor to present him, himself and so on. Victor, um, please make yourself com comfortable. Yeah, hello. So 
Um, when you enrolled this workshop, there was only two names. That was Gilfranco and Vinicius. But when Isabella and I, we are partners, we saw that this workshop was taking place. We got super excited and we asked to help to, and to, to participate and to support the team. So Isabella and I, we are the surprise for you today. So my name is Victor. Um, I am a researcher at the Leibniz Universität in Hanover in Germany. And maybe you can go through the next few slides. I'll just show you some, some images of the kind of project that I do on my free time. So for example, this one is the imagination of what happens when a village um, moves to one single object in the Italian Alps or the next one is, um, Jill, can you jump to the next one? The next one is a speculation about the production of a city that does not have any ground or a city where architecture becomes the ground for architecture. The next one is another speculation of what happens if, he, if we as humans start to occupy the great vortex of garbage in the ocean that exists right now, that is this ground produced by, by plastic. And it's a collage of um, spherical projects from the long history of architecture. And then the next one, that is the last one that I'm showing today, is this lab stack. That is a speculation about what happens when architecture is not inhabited or occupied by human beings, but only by capital investments. That is a project that I developed with Isabella Previci, who is my partner in crime. So I, uh, I opened the stage for her, let's say. Hello, everyone. Thank you for participating in the workshop. So, Gilles, you can move forward. So, I have just graduated uh, in the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism in Mackenzie Presbyterian University in Sao Paulo. Uh, and this is a few images of my thesis. Uh, I am interested in speculative architecture, into narratives, in literature, and also in the decolonialism aspect of architecture. So the, the, my thesis is called the data center of Babel. You can move forward, Jill, please. Uh, and it's based in, in all of the things I mentioned before. It's developed as a labyrinth and it's a tower of data and it has a history that the, the tower fades in. It collapses when the AI realizes that the building is made only for destruction. So it's not a desiring building, it's just more as uh, a storytelling. You can go on. Uh, and these are a few models I've made during the process, made of resin. You can go forward, Ju. Uh, and I had my interest in, in digital architecture began when I was in, um, in Erasmus in, in Germany. And there I learned more about Rhino and Grasshopper and started not only, my interest there is not only in coding and the shapes you can get with it, but also with the storytelling you can have behind it. To use it only as a tool and not as the objective. You can go on. And this was a, a project I developed during my Erasmus. You can go forward. And also I've worked over a year in an office called Estúdio Guto Requena in Sao Paulo, uh, where it has uh, a really close relationship, relationship between technology and emotion. And this is a project I participated. It was an art installation where people could, uh, you can move on. 
where a neurosensor was put in every participant and many questions were asked during the, the installation and the neuro, neuro sensor could kept the, the information and made this uh, art, uh, uh, this interactive art in the table. So that's it for now. I will ask Vinicius to introduce himself. Hello everyone, uh, I'm still a student in UFMS, the same university that Joe Franco is professor. And here are some of my projects that I, I presented in the classes. So the, the one in the left, it was an hostel that we have to preserve the facade of the left volume. And we use some techniques to put the, the bigger volume on the back and preserve it, the facade. And on the right, we have a kind of metropole parasol uh, wafer structure. It was from Forest School that we made it on uh, a class in university. And I'm studying biomimicry right now. We are making a, a research, me and Joe Franco, and we it will be presented in the next slides. So you can go forward, Joe. Your mic is off, Ju. You are muted. Sorry. <laughs> That's the contemporary condition using these platforms. Um, so we would like to ask you to present themselves and we suggest some, some issues, some questions. Um, the name, where are you from? What's your current interests? What you're doing? so on. So we invite you to, to open uh, your camera and, and participate the, on this presentation, right? Some, someone would like to start? Good morning, everyone. Hello, Good morning. My name is Fernando. Um, I, I am a, a, a doctoral, a PhD student in nomads, just like Joe Franco. Right. It's, a, ple it's a pleasure to meet you uh, at person, Gil. I, I knew your, your wife, Juliana. Okay, right. Is, 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 is a wonderful person. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you too. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I am a, a professor from State University of Mato Grosso. Right. Uh, I'm, I actually, I live it in Cuiabá, the capital of uh, Mato Grosso State, but I live, in, I work in um, a country city called Barra do Bugris. Um, my interest is in, in this course is just um, my, my, my master's degree. I had studied um, some semiotics. Okay, right. Vertical semiotics. And now. Percy semiotics? Excuse me? Percy, Percy semiotics? Just American a little. Semiotics? Just a little, uh, Charles Sander Pierce. Okay. Just a little, but it, it's fundamental for every student uh, in semiotics to be no just even just a little bit of Charlie Sander, Charlie Sander Pierce is, is will be necessary. Okay. And um, now I, I have some students in cybernetics applied in architecture. Anya Pratik is my guy, is my orientation. Ah, okay. Oh, Two. Very nice. She's wonderful. She's a wonderful person, wonderful researcher, and at all. So my interest is um, make a make a link uh, with with the the semiotics uh, theoretical um, foundation, uh, fundamentation, right? And and how I can use for uh, then 
for my uh, current research in cybernetics. Uh, my research, actually, my research is about uh, cultural landscapes and how, how a system. And um, the use of this, this software of, 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 of uh, with uh, rhinoceros and uh, grasshopper for the uh, expo 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 exploration design for uh, um, biomimetic design is so relevant uh, because I have a, a feeling, I have an um, intuition about this, 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 this way of the, the intervention can be useful for my uh, ponderations and my, my, my reflections about the cultural landscapes, how as a system. Okay. And, and, and that, that all, uh, thank you for uh, everyone. Thank you, Gil, for accepting me. And excuse me for my poor English. I will do my best. I, I, I promise to you. Right, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I love Anya. Anya is an amazing person and, and great researcher. And um, I have to ex excuse myself for my English as well. So we would like to to try to do our best, right? Um, so thank you, Fernando. And uh, we can move on. Who's the next? And can, like I make to... two, can I make okay. two suggestions? Please, Victor. The, the first one is that we shouldn't apologize for our English because <laughs> there's no right or wrong. We are all here sharing ideas. And as long as we communicate, we are, uh, it's, it's perfect English. And the second suggestion is just for time reasons, I think that we should go following the participants list here on, on Zoom. And I think yeah. that we can save some time this way. So if everybody's fine with that, I would ask Avas to introduce himself or herself. Okay. Hello. Uh, am I with you? Hello, Avas. Hello. Hello uh, my name is Avas Ujain, and uh, I'm uh, currently uh, third year in the uh, National Institute of Technology, Calicut, in India. Uh, so, uh, uh, about interest, like, uh, I, like, I don't have a specific interest as such right now. So, uh, what I, like, uh, through this workshop, I believe that I can set the interest into the field and uh, in the future pursue through in this field itself. Okay, right. So, so I wanted this uh, course to be a stepping stone to uh, my future. Yeah. That's... Okay. That's nice. Very nice. Thank you, Avas. Thank you to, to join us. Actually, thank you for conducting this workshop. It's <laughs> a huge honor to come and participate. Okay. Thank you, Avas. So, Victor, what's the next? Uh, can, uh, who's the next? Can you see? I, I, I said that we shouldn't apologize about the English, but I will apologize about mispronunciating uh, the name of a few students. So, I would like to ask Abidu Haman to introduce him or herself, please. Abdul, can you hear us? Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm okay. Egyptian. Uh, I'm, a, I'm Egyptian architect. Actually, I'm graduated in uh, 2018. 
uh, for me, uh, I am I am participating in this uh, workshop because I uh, I'm interested in uh, in both in in designing with nature and uh, and uh, and the technology and the using the primitive design in in this process. Uh, and I, I found this. I'm not hearing you yet. Would be a, a great chance to me to uh, something like that. Hello. Hi, Abdul. I think your connection it's a little bit poor. Uh, it it was a little bit hard to to get it. But if you feel comf comfortable, you can write in the chat. Maybe your introduction. Um, in, in the meanwhile, I would ask if Alexandros would like to introduce himself and we pay attention in the chat to read Abdul Rahman introduction. Greetings. Hello. Uh, my name is Alexandros Estatiades and I am from Greece. Uh, I'm a PhD student in uh, the Department of Architecture of the University of Thessaly. Uh, and my PhD research uh, is uh, the, the, the theme of, the, my, of my PhD research is uh, biomimicry and contemporary digital uh, technologies of uh, analysis, uh, design and fabrication. Uh, more specifically, uh, uh, we examine uh, we, uh, cells and exoskeletons from, for, for example, from sea cells or eggs of uh, insects, uh, right. for example. And uh, we are transferring uh, design solutions with the aid of CAD uh, software, like Rhino and Grasshopper. And uh, we, we try to fabricate uh, prototypes uh, with the use of uh, Additive manufacturing. Uh, that that's pretty much uh, a quick summary of my current work. Uh, oh, and I come from a different background. I studied uh, visual arts initially, and then mm -hmm. moved moved to. I did my master in uh, product design, and now my PhD in uh, architecture. Super okay, interesting. Very well. And and uh, and last, um, you are doing it in the Saloniki. Excuse me. You are studying your PhD in the Saloniki, or not? I live in the Saloniki, but the university is in uh, Volos. Uh, but uh, ah, okay. due to COVID uh, restrictions, uh, I've been oh, working uh, uh, from uh, my home at Thessaloniki. I can say from my experience that Thessaloniki is not a bad place to be. You've, you've been here? I've been uh, two times. It's a beautiful really? city. Beautiful. Uh, it's nice. <laughs> we have uh, good food. <laughs> so okay, that... Very nice. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can jump to Ana Carolina. We are not listening to you, Anna. Are you listening now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm good morning. Anna Carolina. I'm a master student at the Federal University of Vistosa in Brazil. Cool. And I am researching about digital tectonics. Gio knows me already because he was yes. at my board. 
and I am interested in this workshop because I'm going deeper into the discussions of computational processes and I'm also interested in learning a lot more about semiotics and the cool. softwares I'm familiar with is I'm honestly I'm beginning my experience and as helper in my lessons, but I'm familiar with the most popular ones here in Brazil that are SketchUp, AutoCAD, Photoshop, Illustrator, and so on. I think that's it. Okay, very nice. Thank you, Ana. It's a pleasure to Bye. see you again. Thank you, Ana. Very nice. So I guess the next one in the list that is shifting all the time, I didn't know it before, <laughs> is, is Dani. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dhwani, and uh, I am an architect from India based in London right now. Um, I am studying for my Master of Architecture at the Bartley School of Architecture, University College London. And uh, the reason I opted for this course was because I, uh, because of my interest in biomimicry. Um, and what I hope to learn from this course is I basically want to understand how I can use computational design to achieve biomimicry. Um, that is something I struggle with, which is why I'm really excited to be here. Right. Thank you, Duane. Thank you. So we already had Fernando, so I think we can go to Harshi. There is Danny as well. There is Dani and there is Danny. Yeah, I think Danny didn't um, introduce it. So Danny, do you hear us? Hello, Danny. We cannot hear you, unfortunately. Uh, maybe if you over your mouse in the bottom left, you have the microphone icon with an arrow pointing up and then you can select a microphone. Maybe because you have your earphone and your microphone, your, your laptop's microphone. I don't know if it's the right one selected. Yeah, we cannot hear you. If you um, if you feel comfortable, you can write your introduction in the chat as well, and you can see this mic problem you might be struggling. But don't worry, it's always in this technology conference that technology fails. <laughs> I guess so, Fernando already uh, introduced himself. Now we have Harshi. Hi, so I'm Harshi from India. And my current interest is in computational designing. And I'm currently working with Studio Symbiosis from India. And the reason why I joined this, um, this thing is because I'm really interested in biomimicry. I'm not right. so familiar with it, that's true, but I'd love to learn something about it. So that's the reason why I joined it. So I'm currently a bachelor student, but I'd love to learn something which I'm not so familiar with. Thank it's you. a good exercise. Yeah. Thank you, Harshi. Very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Now moving forward, we have Hassin. Hello, um, Hassin. Um, I'm I'm originally from Bangladesh, and 
I'm doing my master's at the University of Kent. Um, so, uh, like, I was uh, told about digital futures from, uh, I heard from, about digital futures, futures from my professors, and I was looking for, like, and this seemed to be a very nice fit because, like, I just did a module where I had to uh, uh, read about uh, Pierce's semiotic, uh, 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 semiotic models and then think about it uh, from an agent's perspective. So that's uh, that seemed to be a like a very nice happy coincidence that I came across this workshop cool. and. Yes, uh, currently I'm working with uh, the concept of game theory and, and negotiation. And uh, so I think like this workshop will help me find some good footing. Okay. okay. Very well. Thank you, Hasim. So we can move on. What, who's uh, the next? Now we have Kayur. Okay, you are, can you listen? Hello. Hi. Can you please introduce yourself, Kier? Hey, can you hear now? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah, I'm Kier Shah from uh, KRVI in Mumbai. I'm an undergraduate student. So uh, yeah, uh, like in India, we have a number of different typologies in nature. So you know, like it was like going with the title, like designing with nature. So I thought it could be like, how could computational design be used to, you know, morph with the nature, like the different typologies, like in the coast or in the hilly areas or in the deserts, like or like in the forest or anything of that sort. So how 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 I could use technology to create a, a design that goes with the context as well as the 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 people living over there, like the traditional styles we already have. How one could morph with the uh, the, the software and you know, create a new sort of design. And like, I'm totally new to Rhino. I was just trying it out during the vacations, uh, different, like, different through the YouTube video. So I thought it could be like a good continuation to that. The, the workshop could be a good continuation. Yeah. We're, ha we're really glad to have you here, Kayur. Thank you. Yeah. And now we have Rodrigo Cândido. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, uh, I'm from I'm, I'm Rodrigo uh, Rodrigo from Brazil from Recife, Pernambuco. Uh, I'm just recently graduated from. Uh, university, uh, Federal University of Pernambuco. Uh, I studied uh, architecture and urbanism. And although I didn't study uh, any of parametric uh, architecture in the university, I start to to explore a little bit on my own, my own after graduated and and. I'm thinking maybe I'll explore it more in a master's degree. So I'm here to to uh, know you guys and to uh, so I, you could uh, exchange a little bit more and explore. Uh, uh, and I really like the email that we uh, we all received, so that we have a little uh, material to start from and go a little bit deeper in the parametric architecture. Uh, I'm, my current interest uh, is in permaculture and uh, 
uh, bioarchitecture and sustainability. So I have a little uh, a small firm that we do residential projects. We uh, and I participate in another collective uh, uh, that work is is uh, agroecology urbana. So uh, we are we are exploring in this. Uh, both direction. So uh, I really think how to integrate the uh, aromatic architecture in uh, bioarchitecture is mat a natural material. So I'm, I'm thinking how to do this uh, intersection uh, in my master degree, maybe. So uh, I'm thinking mm, go this direction. Uh, I'm here to I'm here to to explore a little, a little bit more, as I said in the beginning, and to do a little bit of network to know you guys that work in Brazil also, uh, and and maybe we could exchange a little bit uh, after the workshop if it's okay for you. Uh, I participated in the last year workshop here in the Digital Futures with the Materializing Mathematics with Joseph Schoma. So uh, we could uh, play a little bit in, in the grasshopper and mathematics in this, uh, uh, in this way. So I have a basic knowledge of uh, grasshopper and rhino a little bit uh, in the beam softwares and working mainly in uh, uh, AutoCAD, SketchUp, uh, Photoshop, uh, and, and design, and, and so on. Uh, so I'm a beginner here. <laughs> so that's it. We can talk a little bit more in the workshop. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Rodrigo. We, we, are, we are all beginners. And for, for a little, we don't meet each other because Isabella and I, we were in February, we were in Recife for a workshop in Unicapi. So yeah, maybe next time we go to lovely Recife, we can have uh, some of Maginho. I hope you. I hope you can. You can, you can share the information on time so I can participate. Also, <laughs> I would like to see that. Yeah, sure, definitely. And do we have anybody else, or we went through? I think we went through everybody, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I would just say that Daniela answered in the chat that she's from Brazil, graduated in UFMS, and she's interested in digital design. Uh, she chose our workshop because she already knew us, and she's familiar with rhinoceros and grasshopper. Okay, very nice. Okay, we can we move on? Everybody has yes. had presentations. Yes. Okay, I'm trying to. Okay. So uh, here um, we have the original descriptions of the, the workshop, but uh, we have uh, some updates in order to make in our predictions more powerful, I think and uh, engage it with the events that we are currently experiencing. Uh, so let's see next. Here we have our schedule, a first day of presentations, theoretical approaches and discussions, um, a second day to develop the projects, the designs, and uh, a third day to present the final results, you know? It's a quick workshop, but uh, in our understanding, um, it can be very dynamic and efficient 
not just for not only in relation to the final products, but um, um, especially in terms of we can learn here from each other, right? Mm. So we have um, general goals. So of course we have here, uh, we, we would like to, to make some cultural exchange, discussions, development, and um, especially apply the potential of digital architecture critically. I think here we have an, an important issue uh, because we have been following for some time the development of digital technologies, uh, especially who applied to, to project development. But um, realize that there is a certain detachment from the reality we live. The system, systemic notion that architecture is not a field of acknowledgement and uh, actuation autonomous and isolated um, is fundamental to us. So from now on, we are dealing with the, um, um, the relationships we want to, to establish in the cities uh, and on the planet, especially. So we think that uh, our future depends on that. So we have updated the, the goals to, for example, uh, you can choose to produce an installation proposal that explore more friendly relationships between architecture and nature, or to produce an architectural manifesto that uh, emphasize the urgency in redux reducing the destruction of nature, or to produce a manifesto as architecture that can help to bring awareness to the, the, the extermination of native populations, the, India, the indigenous ones, and their knowledge, or to produce an architectural proposal that can support the distribution of masks, face shields, alcohol gel, and other equipments and products to fight COVID-19, or all the foregoing alternatives. So here we have our proposals uh, in terms of goals to this workshop, right? As final results, we, we would like to achieve uh, render proposals or drawing proposals or models made from everyday materials you have in your home, for example, or all the foreign-going alternatives, right? Okay, so um, let's start thinking a little bit about the economic and social reality we, we are living right now. Um, while the, the majority of the population has the difficulties to, to obtain the minimum, to, minimum resources to survive, we have a super concentration of income as pointed here. For example, we have this notice with the news, this news, the ranking of the 2021 world's billionaires released on uh, 2021 by Forbes revealed that the number of Brazilians in the seven digit club rose from 45 registered in 2020 to 66. In total, these Brazilians hold a set of uh, 220.4 billion against uh, 127.1 billion last year. So this is happens. Sorry. Um, when, especially when we are living this situation about the COVID-19, here we have some data from world and from, from Brazil. We have more than a half, uh, a half million cases here of 
people who died. And uh, another issue is about who has suffered the most, uh, precisely the original peoples, which they lose more and more they, their rights. Um, here we have some news from Campo Grande here in Brazil. For example, indigenous people denounced the disappearance of 1,300 doses, doses of uh, vaccine against COVID-19. And also Mato Grosso do Sul um, has the third highest lethality among indigenous population. So this picture, I think this image show, shows the, the, current, the current scenario here in Brazil um, in terms of what, what happening. But um, um, we believe that in a way it represents a reality that um, uh, happens in all, all the world in the relationship between the dominators and the dominated, right? In other direction, we have this very important architect, um, one of the world's leading architectural firms producing a, a project to create um, citizen buildings on Mars. What is the cost of this project? Um, who can afford to go to Mars uh, in, the, in the next future? Um, and what about other people? Um, are we doomed to survive on a destroyed uh, planet without uh, any resources? Uh, it's a thing we would like to, to put on the table to discuss with you, right? That's why we would like to ask what, why fight for the planet is not a cliche. We have this concept, uh, indigenous concept called uh, what, uh, Pachamama is something about um, mother nature. It's like mother nature concept. We are part of the nature. We have to fight for the planet and uh, it's not important if it is a cliche or not. Uh, it's the only planet we have until now. And uh, I think it's more uh, easy to, to achieve in balance and, and um, uh, it's possible all of us to survive here um, before we, we think and go to another planet, I, I think. So we have this indigenous leader here in Brazil, Ailton Krenak, and uh, he produced this statement about humanity. He asks, humanity, what humanity is this? I don't want to be part of a kind of a humanity club, totalizing, selfish, and violent. So, okay, that's the history of the, the humanity, but, um, we think we can be better and um, look into the, the indigenous behaviors and, and the way of thinking about the planet. I think we can move more close to this, this um, feeling, for example, and um, try to produce more uh, equality, uh, societies living in, in balance, in, in balance uh, uh, on the planet, right? So we think it's urgent. Resume the reasonable, reason, reason, reasonable measure. Um, we think we lost uh, the measure of uh, ethic uh, foundations. We have to think about um, in, in order to reestablish the ethical frameworks that define the concept of society and also the concept of, the concept of humanity, um, like the um, Ayutthaya Kranak, Ayutthaya Kranak proposed, right? And also the redefinition 
of the concept of nature, abandoning anthropocentrism. We think we are nature. We have to change. We have to shift this paradigm. We have to think more in order to, um, to establish new uh, values, uh, including um, ourselves in this, this vision of nature, not uh, split from, from the nature, right? So we, pro we propose that uh, some fundamentals and concepts from cyber semiotic could help us to, to think about um, how can we produce in this uh, workshop some architectures, we can um, produce some contributions in order to, 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 to produce some reflections about these issues, right? Cyber semiotics is a transdisciplinary meta science that uses the concept of second order cybernetics and Charles Peirce's semiotics. For example, we have uh, the notion of systems from cybernetics, system concepts, of course, but also system theory uh, from proposal proposed by uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy's and also complexity um, from Edgar Mohan and, and, and other guys, and other scientists and researchers. Um, we have also the concept of Umwelt proposed by Jacob van Uxkul. Uh, we will see some next, next uh, uh, slides of, of these presentations. The concept of communications between animals and machines by Norbert Wiener. Uh, it's from uh, um, cybernetics. Um, also, the Marshall McLuhan and Stafford Beer's concepts of mental expansions, which uh, allowed us to use uh, technology to um, uh, communicate better. And uh, I think uh, it's possible to improve our understanding of uh, the, the relationships between uh, humans. We have also the concept of ob observation systems observed by second order cybernetics via Heinz and Foresters, the um, concept of autopoiesis by Maturana and Varela, which are biologists, very important researchers and um, at least we have concepts of sign and representations by Charles Sanders Peirce, especially his phenomenology, which uh, established some ideas about communications. And um, we have to think how to, to improve um, our capacity to communicate using, in, in our case, uh, architecture, design, and so on. So here we have um, this, this issue about, this issue about um, Umwelt proposed by, the, by X school. X school argues that Umwelt represents the ultimate reality of the species, the collection of signs that form the representation of the world's reality for the species. Thus, if an organism in universe is not compatible with this ultimate reality, there is no survival, no permanence. We believe uh, we have to, is, um, we are going in this direction in terms of the um, humans umwelt. We are focusing in, in the exterminate ourselves in our vision and uh, we have to try to uh, reduce the entropy, the, the speed of entropy, in order to um, keep ourselves on the planet uh, for for more long time, right? The, the representation of the world for human beings is in a constant process of entropy, okay? Since their ultimate reality is in permanent disconstruction due to the imbalances they promote. It is urgent to seek to reestablish this balance or reduce the speed of imbalance based on approaches that 
take into account different systems and their reciprocal influences. So here we have this concept of biomimicry. Um, I would like to invite uh, Vini to talk a little bit about uh, biomimicry, right Vini? Yes, so the term biomimicry first appeared in the 50s and it was spreadly along the scientists in the 80s. Oh. And it preceded by biomimetics, by, which was said by Otto Schmidt in the 50s and bionics by Jack Steely on the 60s. Uh, biomimicry is the concept that we use the solutions made by the nature and founded by them. So the problems that we're facing nowadays, like energetic problems and pollution, uh, we can already find the, the solutions in the nature. So why struggle with these problems if we already met the solutions? And what we're trying to bring to this workshop is see biomimicry as a functional solution and not a static position. So we are trying to bring the, the solutions and the, their fu function and bring to architecture. And in the book, uh, I think you can pass the, the to the next slide, Joe. Okay. In the book, Biomimicry. Mm -hmm. I think one less. Okay. In the book, My Mimicry, Michael Pollan uh, put these examples for us. So uh, the first three images, it is uh, an example that it's a deployable example, which show us that this can provide passage to, to humankind like, uh, and to ships. And then another, Examples are biomimicry in tensionated structures and bamboo and shells and domes. So what they do, it is take the these examples and use the, the structure of the shell as example, which they will make the, the forces go all around the shell and the domes and make it uh, structured possible and I think it is this you can go to the next slide Joe okay yes um, here we have this another situation uh, looking to the nature I produced this uh, experiment um, programming in processing maybe 10 years ago I don't, I don't remember in order to try to simulate the behavior of the, the, the plant, not just to look into the, the formal uh, characteristics, but uh, especially focused on, on, on the behavior, right? Um, the video is not working, but okay, I think you can understand my, my position. And... Um, we have also another important concept is about autopoiesis proposed by the biologists uh, Maturana and uh, Varela. The conception of autopoiesis allows the first understanding that uh, a system can self-regulate and self-manage spontaneously in nature. Cellular processes are an example of this theory. However, what is verified is that the systems are not isolated from each other. On the contrary, the greater the level of complexity, the greater the level of interactions and possible links for exchanges and the greater the connections that can lead to an imbalance between the parts, right? So we can, for example, look to those uh, indigenous uh, buildings in order to produce, uh, produce a, a community called um, a taba, for example, here in Brazil. And uh, we can uh, realize a great system um, allowing the connections between all the buildings 
and also being uh, influenced by the nature and, and influence and influence the nature, but with uh, and, uh, with balance. So um, we can do um, this special condition. Um, how can we produce systems in order to um, be more integrated with nature, right? So we have this another concept here from our uh, indigenous called uh, Tecopora, which means um, something about the indigenous well living, the, the, um, the way um, the behavior and the way of life that indigenous used to, to practice, uh, respecting the nature and including, including himself in the concept of the nature, right? So we can think about uh, a concept, for example, ecology without nature. Here we have this kind of uh, um, um, Sorry, I forgot about the, the, the idea is more sarcastic situation involving uh, we are together with the nature, we are inside the nature, we are looking uh, to the nature, um, we are looking to the ecology using nature principles or we are studying uh, another kind of uh, relationship uh, with nature. So I'd like to, to invite Isabella to talk a little bit about this for, for us, right, Isa? Okay, sure. Uh, so ecology without nature is a concept that Timothy Morton suggests that nature was, you can go forward in the slide, uh, that the idea of nature was conceived in the Romantic era uh, where we had an um, admiration for it, but at the same time we destroy it. So this idea of perfect nature is the is the, the main uh, concept that destroys the nature. So he says we need to destruct this idea made in the Romantic period of that nature is this perfect and untouched place and be part of nature because uh, from centuries human humankind tried to overcome nature uh, and it's a uh, fighting without a winning because we are destroying everything that supports our living in the earth. Uh, earth may not be destroyed, but our living conditions can. So uh, you can move forward. I will read a quote from Timothy Morton that says, the sky is falling, the globe is warming, the ozone hole persists. People are dying from radiation, poisoning, and other toxic agents. Species are being wiped out, thousands a year. Uh, coral reefs are almost all gone. Huge global globalized corporations are making bids for the necessities of life, from water to healthcare. Environmental legislation is being threatened all over the world. What a perfect opportunity to sit down and reflect the ideas of space, subjectivity, uh, environment and poetics. Ecology without nature claims that could be no better time. So you can move forward, you. So uh, Timothy Morton is part of a philosophical group called uh, Speculative Realism, um, especially from the Graham Harmon research where he has the objected oriented ontology, which is a philosophy where uh, there's no hierarchy between objects, and he considers objects everything that exists in the real world and in our minds, uh, like the ideas of things. So a human being is as much important as a table or any other object. Uh, and Timothy Morton is a philosopher that is also part of this movement, uh, but he says we are part of nature, we should not overcome it. So it's this idea of uh, deconstructing the idea of overcoming nature and be become part of it. So we, uh, we can still have a few more years in the earth. So uh, moving forward, um, as I mentioned before, I did my thesis based on this 
uh, urgence and this philosophy, uh, where uh, strange ob objects such as a data center in a tower version uh, appears in the middle of the Amazon forest in Brazil. Uh, and it has these purpose of showing the destruction and what should we do? What can we do? And also uh, as a product of my thesis, there's a video that uh, Gilles will show you in the next slide. It's subtitled. So if you have any questions afterwards, you can show it in the chat. Gilles, please, if you can. Uh, I think you share without sound. You know what I mean? Uh, when you share in the Zoom, and normally they ask if you want to share sound. I think I have to stop to share and share again, right? Yeah, and, and mark with um, share with sound. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. In the very beginning, I think there's no sound, right? There is actually. You can see if the sound in the video it's. Isa, maybe you can share the, the screen? Yeah, sure. Let me just open. Okay, let, let me. I can try it again. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um... When it asks for what you want to share, if it's your screen, if it's a window, there is a checkbox saying share desktop audio, if I'm not wrong. You can see if then the video, the sound is lower or high and maybe increase it a little bit. Wait a minute. No, it's working. It's working? Yeah. No, there's no sound. I think that is. Do you want to show it? Do you want hey. Sure. Maybe you, uh, I can share this this part. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, I'm listening. Good. I am not listening anymore. Not listening. You shouldn't mute yourself, Isabella. Okay. O universo, que outros chamam de floresta, constituiu-se de um número indefinido, talvez infinito, de variações de sons árvores, povos, espécies e vida, coberta por uma densa mata que varia de cor, de altura, de cheiro e de seus habitantes de diversas escalas. Da copa mais alta, vence as camadas intermináveis que constituem a floresta. Nunca fui capaz de ver o seu fim, ou pelo menos era assim que me lembro quando nasci nessas terras. A sucessão de poderes que governaram a sofrida terra brasileira desejavam a nossa completa extinção, nos encurralando e incentivando o pior dos piores seres humanos. 
abriram cicatrizes em nosso universo que nos separaram e por elas vieram a extração da borracha, fogo criminoso e garimpo ilegal, transformando nossas maiores riquezas e biodiversidades esgotáveis em algo que poderia ser comprado com papel. Certa vez, avistei pássaros metálicos sobrevoando a floresta. Eles anunciavam a chegada do homem que comprou nossas terras. Sobrevoavam com ar de dominação, em busca de um espaço para construir o que seria a maior conquista do inútil. Nunca entendi o desejo e ambição humana de se construir verticalmente e tentar atingir os céus. Porém, esse sujeito ganancioso decide erguer a maior, mais alta torre de data center que já existiu, em cima de onde está a árvore e a nomânia, que sustenta o céu. A torre está próxima a uma área de garimpo que invade e destrói nossas terras. Segundo ele, essa torre abrigará todo o conhecimento do mundo, ou o que ele considera ser. Uma torre com mais de 700 metros de altura, que perfura o céu, será projetada e erguida por robôs para abrigar máquinas que trabalham dia e noite, que armazenam senhas, dinheiro digital, fotos, filmes e conversa, do mais útil ao mais inútil do universo virtual. Este homem afirma que o data center é interminável. Os idealistas discutem que as salas labirínticas são uma forma necessária do espaço absoluto, ou pelo menos da nossa intuição do espaço. Cada pequeno corredor dos labirintos correspondem a cinco prateleiras de servidores, capazes de armazenar dados de uma cidade inteira. Nenhum ser humano irá trabalhar na torre, ela será gerida por um cérebro artificial, o GIB, criado em laboratório, o que fará toda a gestão e controle de bom funcionamento da torre. Esse ser artificial foi treinado por anos pelos maiores especialistas para que funcione ininterruptamente, sem nenhuma falha. Não poderiam confiar em uma mente humana que falha para gerenciar o tamanho do investimento e ambição. Rapidamente, a torre foi atingindo altura, erguida por complexas máquinas que funcionavam independentemente do homem. Em menos de seis meses, a torre foi erguida. Mais uma vez, recuamos. Nosso universo está cada vez menor e cada vez menos nosso. O céu está dominado por máquinas que voam e o canto das aves foi trocado pelo barulho frio e impessoal da tecnologia. Durante cinco anos, o criador da torre, que eu passei a chamar de Data Center de Babel, acreditou que tinha construído o maior feito da humanidade. Ele era responsável por armazenar dados de todas as pessoas do planeta. Essa sensação me fazia sentir muito poderoso. Durante cinco anos... A torre funcionou perfeitamente, sem nenhuma falha, até que um determinado dia, o Gib se deu conta da própria e mísera existência. Uma inteligência construída apenas para trabalhar e dar lucros para outros e garantir o perfeito funcionamento da torre. O Gib, apesar de sua artificialidade, também possuía uma consciência assim como nós. Percebe que foi criado para ser um escravo e ser substituído assim que ficasse obsoleto. O Gib, diferente dos homens que o criaram, tinha compaixão pela floresta e plena consciência da devastação que crescia diariamente. Todos da floresta fomos capazes de ouvir o choro de Ogib, que ecoava pela sua larga chaminé, responsável por fazer o resfriamento das máquinas. Aquele choro doía tanto em nós quanto nele. Após horas de lamentação, o Gib, que era o único capaz de controlar o constante resfriamento dos servidores, cessa a circulação de ar, deixando todas as saídas de ventilação. 
e planeja sua autodestruição. Devido ao alto calor gerado pelas máquinas, a torre explode e Ojibe se suicida, gerando uma enorme chama que iluminava o céu de toda a floresta. A queda da torre se tornou símbolo do grande fracasso capitalista e do reconhecimento da destruição dos povos e da floresta. Após séculos invadidos, finalmente tivemos um momento de trégua. Todo o conhecimento do mundo não pode ser armazenado em máquinas e números. A floresta é parte também dessa conquista, desse conhecimento. Hoje, a torre está em ruínas, completamente abandonada e tomada pela floresta, se tornando um símbolo do que jamais deve ser repetido. Okay, so um, now you can share from your screen again, Gil. You're muted, I cannot hear you. Yeah, okay, Isa, thank you. Thank you so much, I love your work, I love this video. Thank you, Gil. So are you watching again? Can you see it? We can see it now. Yes, right. we can see. Okay, right. So moving on, we have um, now um, some methodological proposals using different strategies and softwares and uh, in order to, to give you conditions to start to think in how to, to produce um, I think um, I, I well I would like to invite Vitor again to talk a little bit for this this methodological propositions, right? Victor, please. Yes. So we have an idea that we would like to propose to you. So uh, Gil, Vinicius, Isabel and I, we will be like waiters and waitress. And we would like to offer you a menu of methods, of possible methods, that it's not, um, it's not conclusive. If you want to work with other methods, we are also open for your ideas. So our proposal is that we split you in four groups and I will show you some dishes on this menu and you will have half hour to discuss in between the groups what dishes you want to taste or to try or if you want to try other uh, ideas that are not exactly here, but you are interested. So let me try one thing. I will request remote control. So Gil, if you can allow me remote control. Yes, approved, right. Now, yeah, now I can control your screen. So one proposal is something that Gil Franco and I worked together a few years ago. That is an idea of blending existing images to produce architectural forms. So back then we were interested on in producing interventions on specific sites that were generated by its close contacts, but it looked strangely familiar. So we, we this idea, this, this dish, um, you will be working with a plugin called Monolith that you input uh, images for elevations and for the floor plan and it produce um, a mesh like that. 
and then you will insert this mesh in some context. So for example, here, uh, just for you to have an idea, this group of students were working on the context of Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, and they were using the, some elevations from the sites and this photo from a demonstration that happened there eight years ago. And it produced this funny colorful mesh and the students insert it in a specific context and define it, its interiors with some level of detailing, which we think it's a funny proposal because or an interesting approach because it's very fast to produce variations that are related to the context and at the same time it's strange in it. So one could imagine using a similar method to make a proposal for, let's say, uh, uh, some territory of uh, native people uh, or for inserting it in some highly charged uh, political, highly politically charged context or it's up to your imagination. Also, I think there's, yeah, here you are using some very simple holographic method using reflections. Uh, we're gonna discuss shortly um, a possible method of presentation that we are also interested. Another method that we would like to propose, if you guys are interested, is the use of GANs, which is a specific kind of artificial intelligence. It's called generative adversarial networks. It's basically two AI models fighting against each other. So one AI method uh, model is the discriminator that is trying to understand or to discriminate if one image is real or fake, if it belongs to the training set or it was generated by the other AI model that is the generator. So for example, one could imagine that you use as a training set uh, 500 images of my face, why not? And then this, this, the, the two AI models, they will try to calibrate to generate fake images of my face until a moment that it will be hard for us humans to know if it was a real picture of me or if it was um, AI generated picture. So just as a, an example, bringing it to the context of architecture, we see all these faces and they have only one thing in common, that is that none of these faces are from real people or from people that exist in our physical reality. They were all generated by an AI that was trained with photos of human faces until it learned to fool us very well. So one idea would be just an example, uh, something that we did in the past was to scrape from Google Images modern floor plans. And we use that to train again that faces to instead of generating humans, to generate floor plans. So anything that you have a big data set of images, you can use to train, to generate, uh, to, to, to train a model and generate new images. So this is 
are very fresh and, and not complicated anymore to do methods. There is only one problem if you want to work with it, that it's not so inclusive because to, to use that, we, if you are interested on this method, we will use a website called Runway and to train your own models in Runway, you need to pay $35 for a subscription for one month and put some credits like 10 or $20 to use their cloud computing service. So I would say that, well, we, we are working on groups. If one of the groups uh, is interested on in using it, you would need to consider sharing the costs of paying for the service and paying for the cloud processing. So if you are four persons, one can imagine that each one would need to pay between 12 and $15 for using it. So yeah, it's interesting. However, there is this cost. Um, Another method that we are interested in is also related with this idea of discrete architecture. That is, it's a new discourse in, in contrast with the more blobby-like smooth curvature that we are used to see in digital architecture from Gary, from Zaha. And it is very much brewed or generated in the Bartlett School at UCL where Duani is studying. So is the idea that we design parts and the relation between the parts or the rules that these parts can aggregate and these parts can be arranged to produce holes to produce buildings to produce forms in a kind of bottom-up idea uh, so the idea is that we digitally fabricate parts that are assembled by humans and these parts they are interchangeable they are uh, parts of a catalog like a kit of parts like what one could imagine with Lego. And then the interesting thing here is that these parts can be, they, they are interchangeable. They can be disassembled and reassembled for something else. So what we imagine of a possible proposal that you could think would be a temporary pavilion for distributing uh, COVID-related uh, equipment like masks or alcohol or, or for, for vaccinating that after this crisis that we hope very much will be over soon, it could be, all these parts could be disassembled and rearranged to build something else like uh, classrooms or any kind of infrastructure that a specific community would be in need. <clears throat> so Vinny, can you please join us again? Yes, uh, so this is another plugin, it's called Kangaroo. Uh, it's a plugin to Grasshopper, and he works with tensionated structures. As presented, the, we have spider webs from biomimicry, and it is a really versatile uh, way to produce architecture because you can implement in a lot of places and adapt the material to each place and what is available there. So I think it's a pretty interesting uh, add on to, to Grasshopper and to work in this approach with 
to to buy mimicry and besides of that i want to say that um, even if we presented all these ways to to work you are free to choose a, uh, a way that you feel comfortable and to to produce the the final result okay Um finally, we have this idea that one of the possible outputs from each project uh, would be uh, an augmented reality visualization of the project. So it could be like a short animation like what we have here, showing how one could assemble a structure or you could also visualize your project at one-to-one -one scale in a specific site. And instead of making renderings, floor plans and sections, you could use AR to make photos and recordings of your project in a smaller scale or even at one-to-one -one scale. So, Again, this is one of the dishes in our menu for today, for this week. Uh, but we are open to listen from your side what you want to do to, because you have your own interests or because you think it would be fun to do so. So, Gil, can you take the stage? Please. Okay, right. So that's it. Um, let's work. How do you feel about? Um, I think we we have to stop a little bit and make a, a little break to get some coffee. And uh, we are thinking in, in you guys um, talk a little bit and try to organize yourselves in, in groups. Um, guys, what do you think the the, the most um, strategy to to organize the groups? Victor, Isa, and Vini, what do you think about? I think maybe we take a while to discuss this. Uh, let's make a, a little pause to to the workshop. Right. Um, maybe five or ten minutes. Yeah, maybe maybe we can take a, a ten minutes break. And then we can all come back. We can have like a short conversation between everybody. And then we would like to split uh, this big room that we have into smaller four, rooms. Four or four five rooms. rooms. So you guys can self-organize in groups and decide what dish would you like to have for for lunch or dinner and <laughs> rest of the week also. Okay. Maybe four groups, I think, four groups of three, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will stop to share and I think I, I'm going to stop live stream, right? Okay, yeah, we guys. don't need live stream anymore. <laughs>